follow closely, explaining everything on the board. We go through things faster that way. Uh, I do want to, first of all, uh, round up something from yesterday before starting on this. And this is about vritti and tattva pertaining to the mind. This word vritti, uh, manaso vritti, you'll run across in Srila Prabhupada's books. And um, this is explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the fifth canto. I don't know if right now I can locate the verse to actually read it to you. I did mark it. But I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, so I suppose I'll just explain it. Oh, here we are. Yes. Ah, Krishna provides. Right in front of me. So, <coughs> Vritti Tattva. So, Vritti refers to the conditioned engagements of the mind. And Srimad Bhagavatam 5, 11, 9 lists 11 such Vrittis. So, this term, Manasa Vritti, then this is referring to the uh, material uh, activities because literally in Sanskrit vritti, the word means occupation occupation or engagement so the mind is material, materially engaged when it is involved with these eleven vrittis so what are these eleven vrittis? When the mind is absorbed in hearing, that means material sound vibration, touching, seeing, tasting, and smelling, then it is engaged in sense objects. So these are hearing, touching, seeing, tasting, smelling, five tanmatras, objects of the senses, five kinds of vrittis. When the mind is absorbed in grasping, walking, talking, urination, defecation, and sexual intercourse, these are the engagements of the karmindriyas, five kinds of active senses. So five more vrittis for ten. Then, when the uh, mind is engaged in mental speculation, it means, in other words, when the mind is engaged in itself, you see, when we speculate, when we think deeply, then the mind withdraws from activity and, and external perception and is just uh, moving within itself and speculation and also uh, arising with that speculation are feelings of self-importance. So, so this means that the mind is engaged in false ego. So speculation, false ego, this is lumped together as a an eleventh vritti, self-absorption, we would call it. Self-absorption. So these are eleven kinds of material engagements of the mind. And this manasa vritti is compared in Srimad Bhagavatam 5.11.8. There's a very nice analogy here. And I want to present this to you, hopefully to settle all of these uh, problems with, because I notice it keeps coming up, uh, of distinguishing between the material mind and the pure spiritual mind. We have to again remind you that the term mind, uh, conventionally it, it means, of course, this, this subtle covering of consciousness, but there is a pure mind. And furthermore, this material mind can be purified. Uh, Srila Prabhupada used to use this term uh, Krishnais, like this body, this gross physical body, Prabhupada said, can be Krishnaized by engagement uh, of this body solely in Krishna consciousness. And you know the example of iron in fire? Everyone must have heard that. Fire is 
the fire of Krishna consciousness. Iron means matter. This body is matter. But there is gross matter and subtle matter. So this includes also the mind. So if uh, iron, a piece of iron, is placed in fire, what happens? The iron becomes red hot. That means it takes on the quality of fire. And Srila Prabhupada used to say, if you don't believe that, then you touch red hot iron and see what happens to your finger. It's the same effect as if you touch the fire. You get burned. So the body, gross and subtle, Prabhupada said, can be Krishnaized if we fully engage mind and body in devotional service. So when the mind is Krishnaized, this subtle covering of the soul, uh, then it uh, uh, exhibits a quality known as tattva. Tattva means truth or reality. And uh, this is the original state of the mind. The original mind is pure, the pure consciousness of the soul. So even this uh, present mind that we have can become just like that uh, if it is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness. So anyway, there's a nice example, Srimad Bhagavatam 5.11.8, to help us understand these two states, vritti, manaso vritti, material engaged mind, and uh, tattva, the pure state of the mind. And that is of a lamp, a ghee lamp. So, a ghee lamp you are all familiar with. Now, if a ghee lamp is not properly made, if there's some defect in the materials in the cotton, or the ghee is, is, uh, is, is unclean, uh, so when the ghee lamp burns, the burning is uh, uh, dirty. Uh, it creates a lot of smoke, the flame sputters, the ghee lamp, the brass lamp becomes blackened. So, such a lamp is not very useful. It creates a lot of smoke. It means it turns our ceiling black. So much smoke is coming. And doesn't give much light because it's sputtering. It's not burning properly. And we find we have to re uh, relight such a ghee lamp again and again. It, it goes out. So it's just trouble. So this is the impure state of the mind. Mm? It's, it's not giving much light. Only giving light on gross material objects. Uh, not real transcendental knowledge. It's blackening us, you see, because it's producing all kinds of impure thoughts which contaminate us. This is the impure mind. But when that ghee lamp is made nicely with very pure uh, ghee and uh, clean cotton and, uh, you know, made expertly, and then it burns brightly with minimum smoke, minimum blackness. It's useful, it gives light. It's, we offer such nice lamp to the Lord, so it's, it's a perfect uh, uh, object to be engaged in devotional service. So I wanted to uh, touch on that uh, before going on. That's an important point. Now, as I told you yesterday, today we're going to be talking about the manifestation of the stages of consciousness from Vishnu Tattva, from the Lord Himself. And so I've, I've given this chart here, and I'm going to explain it. So I have some verse references here, so that you not think that I'm just producing this out of the air. Everything I'm presenting <laughs> is from Srila Prabhupada's books. Uh, so, from, uh, here's from a, a purport from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11, Chapter 5, verses 29 and 30. This is, I'll read it. The Supreme Living Entity, Krishna, eternally manifests himself as the chatur vyuha or quadruple, fourfold, plenary expansion. The purport of this prayer is that one should give up his false ego and pray to this chatur vyuha by offering them obeisances. Although the absolute truth is one without a second, the absolute truth displays his unlimited opulences and potencies by expanding himself in innumerable plenary forms, of which the chatur vyuha is a principal expansion. 
The original being is Vasudev, the personality of Godhead. When the Godhead manifests his primeval energies and opulences, he is called Sankarsha. Ardumna is the basis of the Vishnu expansion, who is the soul of the entire universe. And Aniruddha is the basis of the personal manifestation of Vishnu as the super soul of every living entity within the universe. Among the four plenary expansions mentioned here, the original expansion is Vasudev, and the other three are considered to be particular manifestations of him. When the living entity forgets that both he himself as well as the material nature are meant for the Lord's service, the quality of ignorance becomes prominent and the conditioned entity desires to become himself the master. So now from, uh, this is, I'll read the translation of Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi, chapter 2, text 56. The first Purusha avatar, Mahavishnu, in the causal ocean, who is the creator of the aggregate material energy, is an expansion of Sankarshan, who is the second of the Chatur Vyuha. The second Purusha, Garbhodakarshaya Vishnu, is an expansion of Pradumna, who is the third of the Chatur Vyuha. And the third Purusha, Chirudakshaya Vishnu, or Super Soul, is an expansion from Aniruddha. So, now you know that I'm not pulling this out of a hat. <laughs> And furthermore, we have some quotations from Srila Prabhupada that, um, yes, Vasudev, uh, uh, I've, I've put in here, Vasudev uh, is Krishna in his extra Raja Lila. So, Srila Prabhupada uh, explains that when Krishna apparently leaves Vrindavan to go to Mathura, and then to Dwarka. Actually, Krishna remains in Vrindavan, but in a form called the Bhavarup. Uh, he's existing within the hearts of his devotees in their ecstatic love in separation. This is called Viraha Bhakti. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in his seventh of eight Shikshashtika prayers, praise uh, Govinda Virahena Me so Virahena Viraha O Lord Govinda feeling your separation so uh, then he's crying torrents of tears and his hair is standing up on end the ecstasies are manifesting Shunyayetam uh, Jagat he feels the world is vacant so this is this is the quintessential, very fancy word, uh, most essential expression of this viraha bhakti. This is the uh, mood in which Krishna remains in Vrindavan after he apparently leaves to go to Dwarka. He's there, but in this bhava rupa, within the hearts of all his devotees. So he's not seen externally, but he's there. He's there even more because the devotees are practically dying from love of Krishna in his separation. So, uh, then, who is uh, going to Rinda, uh, Mathura and, uh, and uh, Dwarka? That is Vasudev, who is, again, that is Krishna, expanded beyond his Vrajalila. The Lord actually never leaves Vrindavan. Hmm? But he expands as Vasudev, to go to Mathura and Dwarka. Also, we have, I'll read uh, from here, um, Srila Prabhupada writes that, um, yes, in Srimad Bhagavatam 3.134 purport that Lord Narayan, the Lord of Vaikuntha, is an expansion or manifestation of Vasudev. And, um, yes, um, I'm sorry, that's Bhagavatam 1, 16, 26 through 30 purport. And in Bhagavatam 3, 1, 34 purport, Srila Prabhupada explains that Lord Ramachandra is this original Vasudev. And his transcendental brothers are the other expansions. You know, Lord Ramachandra has four, uh, th three brothers. 
there are four all together. So Vasudeva is Ramachandra, Sankarshan is uh, uh, Lakshman, um, Pradumna is Bharata, and Aniruddha is Shatrugna. In their original forms of the Tatra Yuma. So also I was mentioning the creation of the Lord, Shristi Pralaya Lila. Uh, this is another Lila of the Lord, and here also the Lord is manifesting his Chatra Vyuha for the purpose of creation. So this is what we're looking at today. We're looking at how creation unfolds in four stages as manifest from this Chatur Vyuha. So aspect of the Lord, this category. So in the Brahman stage, that means the liberated stage, Vasudeva is predominant. And this state of consciousness associated with Vasudeva is called Turiya. I've explained this Turiya. It means above the modes of nature. The Turiya in Sanskrit means the fourth stage. So before the living entity enters into the process of material creation, he is with Lord Vasudeva in the Turiya state. And uh, in this state of consciousness, there is knowledge called Nirupadika Gyan. Upadika means this body. So there is knowledge, there is Gyan without embodiment. And that means without a gross physical body or a subtle mental body. There is direct, Srila Bhakti calls it, uh, Thakur calls it, Svata Siddha Gyan. There is Gyan, which is part and parcel of the Siddha, the liberated, perfected state of the jiva. Svata Siddha Gyan. Uh, Krishna says, Pratyasava Gamam Dharma. Direct perception through transcendental realization. Hmm? So this is the Turiya state, and it is known as Brahma Bhuta. There is no physical embodiment whatsoever. Uh, the soul is shining in his own transcendental form. Now, we have to mention that <coughs> this is very, when we say Brahma Bhutta, this is uh, not necessarily speaking of the Siddha Deya, the spiritual body within Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. Brahma Bhutta can refer also to a living entity floating in the rays of the Brahma Jyoti, or can refer to uh, Vaikuntha, in Vaikuntha. So this is a general term for uh, the transcendental state of the living entity, above and beyond the modes of nature. So Brahma Bhutta, and this stage of creation is, or it's ag not actually creation yet, it's just Brahma, the stage of uh, spiritual existence. So then, when Lord Vasudev recognizes that there are living entities, that there are jivas, jiva atmas, who desire to become independent from him, who desire to try to be Lord themselves, then he expands. So this second expansion is, in the Upanishads, known as Ishvara. And uh, then this is explained in uh, Vaishnava Shastra, like the Pancharatrika literature. This is Sankarshan. And I mentioned down here, Sankarshan, as you've heard already, from Sankarshan expands Mahavishnu. So, the state of consciousness associated with Mahavishnu is called Pragya. And uh, in parentheses I put Sasupti. Sasupti means unconsciousness. Total unconsciousness. Now, we have to like to read something here. Yes. The Adi Purusha, the original personality of God in Krishna, Govinda, expands himself as Mahavishnu. After the annihilation of his cosmic manifestation, he keeps himself in transcendental bliss. The word Yoganidram is used in reference to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
one should understand that this nidra or sleep is not like our nidra in the mode of ignorance. You see, so the Lord is situated in this pragya. This pragya means uh, internal self-realization. Uh, in, in this state, there, the consciousness is not connected with senses, even with mind. Uh, the consciousness is in, in, uh, like yogis, great yogis, they attain this state. Uh, so, it is a state of trance, a trance state. And in that state, the, the bliss of the jiva is realized. Hmm? So, in, in, in within this universe, there are great yogis living in Jana Loka, Tapa Loka, Brahma Loka. So, their material activities are totally suspended. Because in, uh, at this stage, Sankarshan Mahabishnu, uh, the material manifestation has, is just, has not come out yet or is just coming out, but uh, the specifics of creation are not yet, have not yet appeared. So, there is no mind, there is no sense objects yet, there, there is no material manifestation yet. So in this stage of consciousness, uh, consciousness is there, but it is suspended, it is not engaged in anything external. So great yogis achieve this, and then they attain a state of consciousness known as yogi pratyaksha. I put this here, because this is also a very exalted state of consciousness that one can achieve here. And, and uh, they actually realize, because Prabhupada says, at the end of the cosmic manifestation, when this universe dissolves, then Lord Brahma and the self-realized yogis, they go consciously to Mahavishnu and they have his darshan. So it's not that they're just sucked into total unconsciousness, uh, they retain their pratyaksha, their power to see yogi pratyaksha. So this is what happens when a yogi becomes super soul realized in the heart. He has darshan of the super soul. And super soul is not different from Mahavishnu. These different Vishnu states, they're all the same actually, but they just have different functions. So Prabhupada is writing here that, that uh, Mahavishnu, there, there are... There is his state of yoga nidra, and then there is the ordinary state of the deep mode of ignorance, in which there's just no consciousness. So the Lord is always situated in transcendence, Srila Prabhupada writes. He is satchitananda, eternally in bliss, and thus he is not disturbed by sleep like ordinary human beings. It should be understood that the Supreme Personality Godhead is in transcendental bliss in all stages. Sri Madhvacharya concisely states that the Lord is Turiyastitaha, always situated in transcendence. In transcendence, there is no such thing as Jagarana, Nidra, Shushupti, wakefulness, sleep and deep sleep. So we should keep in mind that when we speak of these different forms of the Lord, they're always in this Turiya, transcendental state. But the living entities who desire sense gratification, who desire to enter into the material energy, then at this stage, uh, they will be uh, under this supti, this, this deep sleep, this unconsciousness. Hmm? And uh, then there's an embodiment associated with There's uh, At this stage of creation, karana deha. Karana means causal. And this is equivalent, I was telling you before, when we speak of mind, there are there is the surface mind, our surface consciousness, which we're all operating in right now, I hope. I hope everyone is awake <laughs> <laughs> and aware of what's going on. But we have, uh, like I said a few days ago, a kind of basement of the mind, which, is, which Prabhupada would call the subconsciousness. So this is the karana deha. Karana means causal. It's the, it's the root identity. So this is the subconscious in which all the desires are stored. All the desires are there. And so this manifests here at this stage, uh, Mahavishnu's state of creation. The living entities are in susupti, and the only thing, the only um, uh, materially manifest aspect of their identity is this karana deha. All the compact desires are there. 
And this is called this is called in the Upanishads this state stage of creation, Mahat or Prabhupada in a purport, Avyakta Mahatattva. So I told you what the Mahatattva is yesterday. I gave the example of backstage, all the props, all the ingredients necessary, like in, in uh, 13th chapter of Gita uh, are listed, uh, what is it, 24? Is it 24 ingredients of creation? So this is, yes, typically, it's the, the list is sometimes different. There's sometimes different lists, sometimes it's 28. But generally, what we find mentioned again and again is 24. So uh, this is, uh, again, like uh, active senses, knowledge acquiring senses, mind intelligence, false ego, sense objects, so on and so forth. And these add up to, to 24. So this is the Mahatattva, but Abhyakta, it is unmanifest. It means it is not in use yet. Huh? It is not manifest for the use of the living entity yet. So it, it is in potential uh, just present potentially. Avyakta Mahatattva. Then, so this is important. So you see, I told you the other day about uh, <coughs> Vyasti Samasti. So there's a, there's a m uh, macrocosmic aspect to all this. This is, this is the creation unfolding. But I'm also to, uh, explaining to you here the microcosmic, ha how this is manifest in our own individual case in our consciousness. So we are spirit soul. We are actually always Brahma Buddha in our essential identity. But because uh, we have this inclination to be uh, materially manifest, to have material activities, material identity, therefore, step by step, first Karanadeha, we get this root subconscious identity in which all the desires are compact yet there is still no activity not even subtle ment mental activity yet all that's there is the root desires smothered under primeval ignorance hmm? this is like a coma state you see when one is in coma or again this dreamless sleep the desires are there everything is there but it's all covered by ignorance so this is at this stage. Then, the desires, they're there and they, uh, I pointed yesterday in the chart, this uh, Kala Shashiksha, this time energy. So in time, uh, the desires become stimulated. Hmm? They want to manifest. This happens just by due course of time. So then, at that time, there is a next manifestation. So, Sankarshan, expands as Pradumna or Mahavishnu expands as Garbhadakasya Vishnu known in the Upanishads as Hiranya Garbha. Hiranya Garbha literally in Sanskrit means golden womb. Uh, Garbha means womb or embryo. So golden em so just like a embryonic stage of, of, of the material body. It's within the womb. So here Vyakta Mahatattva so I within the womb, and then gradually, all the uh, the whole body is manifest. All the senses, everything is there, uh, but still not active. Manifest, but still not not active yet. So this is the garbo, uh, the Hiranya Garbha stage, and uh, this is called technically Taijasa. Oh yes, I have to say that what we're seeing here is the progression of the modes of nature too. Uh, I could read a purport. I, I, it slows me down to look for all these references. So you're just going to have to believe me. <laughs> in Prabhupada's books, it's explained that this is uh, the Tamoguna. So uh, the material creation, and you find this repeatedly again and again stated, and technically it is explained in this way. The material creation is first of all manifesting out of Tamoguna. The ultimate background of this uh, material existence is the mode of ignorance. And so the mode of ignorance is manifest here again. Uh, Karanadeha, uh, Sankarshan, uh, Mahavishnu. Also closely associated, probably even said non-different from Mahavishnu is Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva is actually uh, a, a feature of Mahavishnu. 
uh, as just like we said, we were reading the, uh, from the purport that Lord Vishnu, Mahavishnu himself, is above the modes of nature in Turiya, but uh, Lord Shiva, he is the Tamoguna avatar. He is involved directly with the mode of ignorance. So those jivas who are in the mode of ignorance, in this susupti state, unconscious state, that means they are directly under the power of Lord Shiva. So he is the Mahadev, he is the first demigod. He's there before anything else is there in creation. <coughs> Mahavishnu uh, and Lord Shiva. Okay, so then the desires become stimulated by time. They want to manifest more. So is a stage of creation. And this is equivalent to Svapna, means dream. So when you dream at night, the body is not active. But the mind is active. And desires are manifesting in the mind. So this is the Vyakta Mahatattva. Again, this is like the baby in the womb, uh, the embryo in the womb. Everything is there now. You see? the uh, Or what is it called? I, I forgot. No, embryo, fetus. <laughs> anyway, when the full form is there, when it's not just a lump of flesh, but head and eyes and uh, all the uh, features of the human body are there, but it's still within the womb. So this is the this is the Taijisa stage, and this is speaking about ourselves individually. This is where the Linga Sharira, the subtle body, appears. And this again is associated with dream. So Prabhupada says uh, if you want to directly uh, understand the subtle body, then just think of your dreams at night. Because when you sleep at night, your gross body is laying in the bed, not doing anything, but still. You're conscious of activities, of moving about here and there, of interacting with others. And this is in the subtle stage, the dream stage. The, they call it the astral stage. And actually, this, the subtle body in dreams, it, it leaves the gross body and, and moves around on the subtle plane. So this is Linga Sharira. Subtle, this is a subtle stage of creation. And the culmination of this subtle stage of creation, this is when <coughs> the Lord is manifesting He's manifesting this Hiranya Garb. It's a universal form, the subtle presentation of the universe. And at the end, <coughs> Lord Brahma appears from the navel of Garba Dakshay Vishnu. And he uh, meditates and prepares himself for creation. And he uses this subtle manifestation, this Hiranya Garba manifestation of the universal form. This is his blueprint for the work he does which is the gross creation. All Lord Brahma is doing is uh, uh, in a gross physical way duplicating what is manifest uh, in subtle existence. So yes, and this is the mode of passion. Taijasa actually refers to the mode of passion. This is mode of ignorance. Next stage is mode of passion. So it, we have to stress at this point uh, about human nature. Human nature in the Bhagavatam is called uh, Rajasvabhavina, which means human beings are primarily situated in the mode of passion. Human beings uh, are not really... The next stage is wakefulness, Jagrata. But a human being is not really awake to what's really going on around him because our minds are so active and everything we perceive comes into the mind and immediately the mind is working on it and placing it in different categories which Prabhupada says I mean there are any number of purports where Prabhupada says that all this is simply imagination like Prabhupada says for example that when, when, you, when we choose our friends at least in, this, in the material world in material relationships uh, uh, we choose friends we think this one is a friend and someone else we say is an enemy. Prabhupada said this is all imagination. This is all uh, simply the mind uh, pigeonholing different perceptions. And this is dream. This is more or less just dreaming. And so, our, our, of course, we insist very much in our human arrogance. No, this is reality, what I think is true, but it's not. 
And so this is largely the state of existence that human beings are in. They're dreaming while awake. And their emotions are, you know, going all over the place. Uh, and uh, so we're not actually perceiving things clearly. Uh, so this is in the mode of goodness, the last stage, Jagrata. And the Stula Sharia, the gross physical body, gross creation has become manifest. Uh, Lord Paramatma, Chirodakshay Vishnu, he expands into the heart of every body to be there with the living entity. And, but real wakefulness means to be in the mode of goodness, you see. And so this is possible here at this stage. Uh, it's possible for us by utilizing the body and the mind as it is fully manifest in devotional service to come to the pure mode of goodness and then from this mode of goodness rise up again to the Turiya stage beyond the modes of nature and in this way enter into the realm of pure Krishna consciousness. So, I think that's basically everything here. Um, yes, I want to read also from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, verse 4, purport. Shiva Prabhupada quotes from the Sattvata Tantra. This is a summary of what I've just presented to you. For material creation, Lord Krishna's plenary expansion assumes three Vishnus. The first one, Mahavishnu, creates the total material energy known as the Mahatattva. The second, Garbhodakshe Vishnu, enters into all the universes to create diversities in each of them. The third, Chirudakshe Vishnu, is diffused as the all-pervading super-soul in all the universes and is known as Paramatma. He is present even within the atoms. Anyone who knows these three Vishnus can be liberated from material entanglement. So I mentioned yesterday, we are, we are passing in 24 hours through these three stages here. And actually our consciousness is always pervaded by Turiya because the spirit soul is ultimately non-material apart from the modes of nature. So actually we are always uh, uh, in touch with all of these states. You see? So we should... Uh, you know, it's very nice to remember uh, that these states of consciousness are associated with these forms of the Lord. So in our waking state, this is made possible, this waking state is made possible by the grace of Chirudak Vishnu in the heart. When we're dreaming at night, then this is the energy of Garvadak Vishnu. And when we're in deep sleep, unconsciousness, this is the energy of Mahavishnu. And if one rises above completely, the influence of the modes of nature and comes into this unbroken state of consciousness of the Lord, then that is the Turiya state of Vasudev consciousness. This is called Vasudev Sattva by Srila Prabhupada, the pure mode of goodness. So these states of consciousness are going on within us. Every 24 hours we're passing through wakefulness, sleep, deep dreamless sleep. But all that is happening is really is that we are relating with the Super Soul and His energies. So one can achieve liberation by being aware of this, as we've just heard. Now, we want to press on. And here we come to the psychology, the psychological system of Bhakti Yoga. Now, I have to explain that this scheme that I'm presenting, everything is there in Prabhupada's books, but specifically this order of things is coming from Sripad Ramanujacharya. Ramanujacharya is, uh, and, and Prabhupada, there's a purport in which he, Prabhupada is glorifying Ramanujacharya uh, for his expert presentation of uh, the soul's involvement with the Lord's energies in the form of the gross and subtle body. In other words, Ramanujacharya has, has very nicely detailed the psychology 
of the living entity in material nature and uh, by his uh, teaching of bhakti yoga he has shown us how to use the psychophysical body to free the soul from matter and go back home back to Godhead. So this scheme and this terminology is actually from Ramanujacharya but uh, everything is there in Srila Prabhupada's books also. But this is very convenient to use this, this scheme. So we start here with what are called the vikaras, the transformations of the mind, the different processes of the mind. And these are three and Srila Prabhupada says this again and again and again. The three are thinking, feeling, and willing. Prabhupada calls these in a purport the psychological movements of the mind. So this is basically what we mean when we use this word psychology. We mean the mind's phases of thinking, feeling, and willing. So thinking means I am contemplating uh, in, in, a, in a sort of abstract way, detached way, something. It's just being visualized in our mind. Feeling means the emotions kick in. Because the mind is also the seat of emotions. So the emotions kick in and they energize these thoughts. They energize them. And then one really begins to, you know, contemplate them. Uh, uh, already tasting the thing in the mind. <coughs> and then this leads to willing where it has to be enacted. This thing that I've been thinking about, meditating on, and emoting about, and tasting su on the subtle platform. Now I have to actually go out and do it. So thinking, feeling, willing. Now, you see, I put feeling above the other two. Why? Because Ramanuja says that the feeling uh, aspect of the mind, which in, in Western, now also in Western psychology, this is known, this is admitted, these three phases. They give them fancy names. Cognitive, affective, cognitive. It means the same thing. Uh, cognitive, thinking, affective, like the word affection. It's the, the emotions, when you become affectionate to someone, it means the emotions are involved. And then cognitive, cognitive means these, these active senses, physical senses. So, um, of the three, feeling, or the affective, is uh, prominent, most prominent. In other words, thinking and willing are under the influence, under the control of the emotions. And this is, this is the fact of our human existence, that even, even persons who claim to be, you know, philosophers and you know, totally rational intellectual people behind their thoughts because uh, when we assemble thoughts in our minds that, that we, we, uh, we think are you know the real it's a real reasonable logical uh, thing to to believe uh, this assembly of thoughts that we accept uh, is actually on the basis of emotions <coughs> and other other thoughts other ideas we reject we don't like them. And basically, that's what it means. We like these thoughts. <laughs> this makes sense to us. So you see, really, it's the emotions that guide everything. And, and this, is, this is in perfect accordance with uh, Krishna consciousness as we know it from Srila Prabhupada in the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampraday. Because Prabhupada writes in the introduction of Nectar Devotion that the ultimate guiding principle, the ultimate motivation in everyone's life, I explained the other day, is rasa. This taste. This is an emotional taste. An emotional and sensual taste. And that's behind everything. Prabhupada gives the example of, of uh, you know, someone becoming uh, a communist, you know, a revolutionary. And this has to do with, uh, with his taste, his inclination, born of an emotional character, and also his punya, his, his degree of pious activities. So therefore, he, 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 because he has impious activities, he's therefore attracted. His taste is for some atheistic doctrine like communism. So the communists, I mean, of course, they're not so 
we don't meet too many of them anymore. But, <laughs> but communists used to always pride themselves on being totally rational, intellectual. You know, everything is all worked out philosophically. And, uh, but no, it, it, this is a product of emotionalism, and everything is. So this is this is very very important in our understanding of psychology, that it is the feeling aspect of the mind that is most powerful, and uh, it predominates our thinking and willing. So now coming over uh, to thinking, now I'm going. This is the schema of the mind, and I'm always getting questions from our dear Padmasambhava Prabhu. <laughs> He wants to know about structures of the mind. But I have something to say. I, actually, we were talking about this today in the car. Um, that um, we're presenting this schema, but it is a mistake to become, uh, you know, to, to uh, view this mechanistically. It's a mistake. Uh, Padmasambhava Prabhu is often asking me about brain technology. He, he, and, and he's very much concerned with the relationship between mind and brain. And you see, the Western view of, of things, psychology and so on, is um, and that everything evolves from gross to subtle. That mind comes out of matter. Mind comes out of the brain. And the Vedic point of view is exactly opposite to that. So there's, you know, it, it's really futile to try to build these kind of bridges from, from Vedic psychology to brain technology because from our point of view you know to, 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 to look at the brain, the physical brain try to pick it apart and find out from which part of the brain different thoughts are coming this is like opening up the back of your radio taking out all the you know chips and everything and the old radios used to have tubes whatever's in the back now, the wires taking it all out, the printed circuits, and trying to find out uh, uh, you know, this is the part of the radio that plays music, and this is the part that plays news, and this is absurd, because the radio program is not originating, originating in that box. It's subtle. It's coming through sound and ether from, an, from far away, and it's being picked up, and this is what the brain is. The brain is just like a receiving instrument for uh, uh, for uh, uh, the subtle body, the linga sharira. Uh, so so this uh, you know what do they call it? Uh, back technology. <laughs> 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 you know, trying to understand things from the you know the gross thing that's, that that you have ac direct ac access to is not really going to work. So I'm just cautioning them. Please don't get too me mechanistic in your understanding of this. So thinking. Let's start with thinking department. So thinking uh, is, uh, is twofold. The process of thinking, there are two things involved. Uh, so one thing is anubhav, which means observation. And the other is smriti, which means memory. So observation and memory, either together or separately, they constitute thinking. You see, we can uh, just observe things, look at things as they are, without, without uh, memory being involved, and that will constitute thinking. Huh? Like uh, uh, looking at this painting and thinking, <coughs> it's, it's very nice, it's very attractive. And you're not remembering anything you've seen before, you're just looking at this. Or you look at the painting and you think, hmm, I've seen in other paintings like this, but not this particular color scheme. They're different colors. So this one is very interesting because it's more darkly reddish and than, you know, like that. So, but this is basically what thinking is about. There's observation and memory. So then observation. Observation means pratyaksha, Anuman and Dibya Pradyaksha. So what do these terms mean? Pradyaksha means direct perception. Prati Aksha. Aksha means the eyes. The eyes is representing the senses in general. The eyes, ears, tongue, nose, sense of taste. So we come near to things through our senses. Prati Aksha. 
So that means direct perception, seeing something through the eyes, hearing something through the ears. This is one way to observe. Then anuman means inference, and that is tarka, the use of logic. For example, uh, if I'm in my room downstairs, the door closed, and I hear a familiar voice, Padma Samava Prabhu's voice, and he's calling me, Maharaj, do you want uh, something? And, like he does. So, <laughs> so I don't see him directly. I hear him, but I don't see his form. So, but by logic, I conclude that this is called seeing in the mind's eye. So by logic, I conclude that it's Padma Samuva on the other side of the door. Now, it could be someone else. It could be uh, one of his sons playing a joke on me as a <laughs> tape recorder with Padma Samuva's voice in it. And he's just holding it next to the door and playing the tape. <laughs> That's what it could be. Uh, so you see this distinction between seeing directly and seeing through the mind's eye, so to speak, tarka, logic. But it, this, is a, this is definitely a form of observation. Just like in uh, modern science, uh, you know, everyone's been to school, so everyone's passed through science, and everyone's, uh, you may have forgotten what uh, they are, these terms, but everyone has certainly heard of the t a term for instance, like electron or photon. Uh, these are referring to different subatomic particles. So electron, this is, this is the basic unit of electricity. Uh, uh, you see these cables, these electric wires with copper inside, and what th they tell you is that electrons are moving. Electrons are moving uh, uh, through the uh, uh, copper wire. And this is providing energy to the device, a tape recorder, whatever it is that's working, video camera. But no one has ever seen an electron. Hmm. Electron has never been seen by anyone. It's too small to be seen. And probably no one will ever see an electron because uh, the, the instrument that they have, which is um, uh, bringing to the eye the tiniest objects, is the electron microscope which uses electrons to reveal other objects. So you, you, you can't see the electron because it is a thing that is used to reveal other things. So anyway, no one has seen an electron, but by logic, by tarka, you know, by, uh, by observing phenomena, they have concluded that it's only logical to believe that there's such a thing as an electron because, because it, it, it uh, creates an effect. For example, in cloud, with the famous cloud chamber experiment, they have this cloud chamber, and you see these streaks left in the vapor inside, and, th and they say, this is the path of an electron. So something is moving, leaving a streak of condensation. So they call that thing electron. They've never seen what it is, but there's some evidence that something is moving at the speed of light through space. So they give it this name, electron. So this is observation by tarka, by logic, by inference. So it's a valid, in science, it's a valid form of observation, along with direct perception. And then divya pratyaksha. Divya pratyaksha means intuition. And divya, divya literally means divine pratyaksha. So seeing through divine eyes. So everyone has intuition, but it's not very perfect because we're not very pure. We're not very you know, advanced uh, in our spiritual development. But Ramanujacharya, he says, by practice of bhakti yoga, uh, by purification, by the grace of the Lord, then this divya pratyaksha, this divine perception, becomes fully manifest. And so it's by divya pratyaksha, divine perception, divine eyes, just like Lord Krishna gives Arjuna divine eyes to see his universal form. So by divine eyes, divya prachaksha, then the absolute truth is perceived directly. Uh, one gets spiritual, and one needs spiritual eyes to see Krishna. So the, the, um, you know, the, 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 the seed germ, you know, the, the, the little stalk coming out of the ground, this divya prachaksha, is our present intuition. Everyone has some intuition. You know, you meet someone, you have a feeling about a person. You have no evidence, 
no real evidence to think that this is a good or bad person, but you just have a feeling by his presence that I can trust this person or better watch out. You know, you have no, you know, he hasn't done anything, said anything really to, to you know, to, uh, uh, to cause you to think that way. You just have a feeling. So, this is the beginning of the Divya projection. So, these things make up thinking. And they're also involved in dream. What is dream? Svapna. So, in the dream state, uh, this pratyaksha, seeing things through the senses, is shut down. So, the mind does not have access to the sense objects when we're sleeping at night. So, the mind then observes with the help of smriti, remembrance, and also sometimes the intuition, divya pratyaksha. These come together. Uh, anubhava, observation, uh, as smriti. And so we, we in dreams we're, we're viewing our memories. I think I explained this and the mind freely mixes them up. <coughs> and so therefore dreams become quite bizarre. And dreams can also uh, 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 involve memories from previous lifetimes. Things that we have not experienced in this life. And dreams can also be precognitive. When the divya projection intuition becomes involved, we can uh, sometimes see into the future or realize other things which are, which are beyond our present capacity of knowledge. Like, for example, uh, uh, I have uh, a sort of personal experience of this in the sense that one of my godbrothers, uh, I haven't seen him for a long time, but um, I remember him from the 1970s, and his parents were quite famous people. Um, his father and mother were, in America, well-known writers. And uh, his father was actually the editor, I believe the editor of, uh, of a well-known magazine. So they were quite, you know, stellar people, so to speak, in American society. And he was their son, and he, he, he was a rather eccentric kind of person. He, uh, so he became a devotee, and he was sort of fun to be with, because <laughs> he had a very <laughs> active mind. <and laughs> free associate. He was very clever in a, in a funny way, so it was interesting to talk. And he had a very good memory. Very good memory. He memorized verses by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, so you know, if with him you didn't have to read, you just listened to him recite <laughs> verses and translations. He was really clever in that way. So anyway, um, his parents, unfortunately, in I think it was 78 or 79, they died in a terrible airplane crash which happened at Chicago O'Hare Airport. <coughs> uh, the plane took off. It was a Boeing 727, three motors. And the plane took off, and then while it was still above the, air, uh, the runway, it flipped over on its back and fell down mm -hmm. and exploded. And everyone was killed. So uh, then when this, of course, this was big news. It was in all the newspapers of the whole country. And uh, then in the days that followed, it came out, uh, reporters discovered that uh, in the days before the accident, someone had been phoning the Chicago O'Hare airport and saying, I keep having a dream. He was saying night after night, he was not just once, but he was having repeatedly a dream of an airplane taking off, flipping over on his back and falling. And uh, so the in reporters investigated and they found it was indeed... Uh, that uh, officials at the airport were saying, yes, we were getting these phone calls and some time before the accident. We recorded them. Someone was calling and saying, he kept having this dream, but what can we do? You know, someone has a dream, what does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> but then the accident, like, an accident like that actually happened. So, uh, you know, for me, this is, this is pretty, pretty solid proof that precognitive dreams do happen. And I and in parapsychology and these kinds of studies, you know, they they go into it deeply and and list so many uh, events of this happening. But uh, 
Ramanujachari, in his system of psychology, he offers an explanation for this. That this is this is intuition, and intuition again, it's 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 the just the the, the immature stock of divine perception, and this is what we're cultivating in Krishna consciousness. We're cultivating our intuition, actually purifying it, developing until it. Uh, uh, becomes the means by which we actually can see uh, Krishna and his pastimes. So, oh yes, I, and I want to say um, uh, in relation to what I presented yesterday on the board, thinking is basically, you may find this interesting, about subject-object relation. This is what's going on in thinking. And this is explained very nicely by Ramanujacharya. Subject, subject means Paramatma, because Paramatma is providing us uh, with the means by which we can think and perceive and remember. This is all coming from Paramatma, ultimately. So, subject means Paramatma, then Atma, then mind, manas, and then the objects of the senses, what we perceive. Hmm? Uh, uh, no, actually, I'm sorry. The senses themselves, the eyes, the ears, and object are the objects of the senses, what we see. Uh, so, senses is eye and object is rupa form. So, subject again, paramatma, atma, mind and senses. Object are the tanmantras, the sense objects. And then, relationship is the interaction between the two. This kind of creates a, a, a new reality. You see, there's, there's a blending of subjectivity and objectivity. So this is what's going on in thinking. Uh, the, uh, speaking of that relation, that is also what's going on in dream, too. Because in dream, the objects are not there directly. You see, again, sh our senses are shut down, so we're not directly seeing things. But we're still encountering our relationship with them in the dream. The memory of them is there. So, therefore, relation is counted as, uh, as a point in this triad, this triangle. Subject, object, relation. So, this is what is involved in thinking. Now, feeling. <coughs> feeling, emotions. So, Ramanujacharya says there are healthy and unhealthy emotions. And we find this in 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna is speaking of Daili Sampat, or divine qualities and asura sampat, and asura sampat are mentioned emotional states like anger, like greed, like envy. So these are unhealthy emotions, <coughs> befitting <coughs> demons, asuras. So Ramanujacharya says healthy emotions, they culminate in love. This is a very nice definition of healthy emotion, those emotions which flow into love. Srila Prabhupada said, for example, talking about love, um, so the, the beginning appreciation of love, uh, even, even is there before we come to, you know, the transcendental love considerations of prema bhakti and that. Uh, Prabhupada gave the, gave the example of mother's love for child. This is healthy, this is good, this is positive. This is to be desired. And Srila Prabhupada actually said, within the, within the material sphere of emotions, mother's love for a child is relatively very pure. So we can, although we would say it's material, but there's still a gradation, and this is, this is a more ideal form of emotion. So you see, emotions, uh, they flow if they're healthy, then they flow in that direction towards, towards selfless love. A mother's love for her child is, is approaching selflessness. She will sacrifice everything for her child. Uh, a mother who really is attached, who really loves her child, she'll, her, for herself, perform great austerities and everything for the child. So this is moving in that direction of, of real love. So... And then Bhakti Yoga, Krishna Consciousness, is again a cultivation of this, a purification, bringing out the healthy emotions, 
bringing out that love that is that is there in potential in our heart, bringing it out, clarifying it, uh, uh, removing all impurities, and until it becomes. Oh yes, I, I I should mention down here the yogas, bhakti yoga. So the specific yogas, there are specific yogas for each of these mental functions. And uh, I have to jump back to thinking because I forgot to mention this. So for thinking, the yogas which bhakti offers to our thought processes to engage them in Krishna consciousness and purify them are Viveka and Arjava. Viveka means proper discrimination. It means simply seeing the difference between Maya and Krishna. This is Viveka. Uh, that uh, there, there are um, cognitive processes which are uh, uh, which are pro-Krishna, which are you know, bring us closer to Krishna and there are cognitive processes which take us away from Krishna. So Viveka means to see be between the two. And Arjavam means honesty. Hmm? Honesty. Because cheating is taking place here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one uses one's thought, one's cognition for cheating. <laughs> for sizing people up, mm -hmm, making a plan. So uh, in Bhakti Yoga, one should be honest. One should not cheat. One should be honest b about oneself. And one should be honest with others. Mm -hmm. so then this results in pure thought processes uh, so now moving now we've been explaining feeling so here the yogas for feeling uh, outkantya this is from Srimad Bhagavatam a term uh, Ramayujachari he uses uh, a word vimoka for the same thing but uh, I couldn't find that word in the Bhagavatam so <laughs> I picked the one that's there it means the same thing outkantya Longing for the Lord. This is, uh, and this is again, viraha. Uh, this is what Lord Chaitanya teaches. Vipralamba. Uh, this longing for Krishna in separation. This is the ultimate culmination of loving emotions. To always be yearning, longing for Krishna. So this is what Bhakti Yoga is inculcating in the emotions. Along with that, there are supportive emotional states uh, like uh, Kalyana. Kalyana means well-wishing towards other living entities. Daya means to be merciful to other living entities. This mo motivates our preaching, Kalyana and Daya. Ahimsa, uh, not, a, uh, 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 not liking to do any violence, to see any harm come to any living being. Ahimsa. And Anvas, uh, uh, anavasara means a joyful state. Huh? One is, uh, like Srila Prabhupada says, Chan Hare Krishna and be happy. You see, and being happy is actually the <coughs> proof that we're chanting Hare Krishna Hare properly, Krishna. really chanting. So, so this, is a, this is a key feature of the emotional life of a devotee. That he's blissful, he's happy, satisfied. So these are the yogas which bhakti uh, gives to the emotions to engage them, to bring them to Krishna. And then the third is willing. So willing, of course, means use of our power of choice, our free will. And so there are two. Choice means two options. One is to choose defiance of Krishna, to act in defiance of Lord Krishna's order. Krishna says this, but I'm going to do that. That results in karma. Then for those kind of activities,